Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Butterfly Effect podcast. And today, me and Liam have got rankings for the Supermassive Games best villains. So what we've done is we've compiled the, all the villains from Until Dawn through to the devil in me. And of course, there was a little bit of subjectivity in this because we had to pick, you know, there are certain characters that may not fit as villains, but in us, other aspects they do. So we've got a list of 12 and we're going to go from worst to best. Now, what we have done is we've had two, we've had each had our own list and then we've scored them and we've put them together to create this combined list. But what we'll do is we'll put on screen where they ranked in our own personal ones as well. So mate, I'll throw it over to you. What is number 12? So the worst villain in Supermassive Games history is the Hackett. Now, don't get me wrong, guys. If this was a character list, I would put the Hackett's quite highly. They're a fun bunch, you know, we've got good old Travis, Bobby, you know, they're a memorable crew, aren't they? Uh, but, you know, this is a villains ranking, guys, and unfortunately they don't make the cut for villains. Um, I would still argue to this day they're not really villains, maybe they shouldn't even be on this list. Uh, when Jack and I played the quarry for the first time, we both agreed that we sympathised with the Hackett. We didn't think they were bad people. Instantly I knew they were putting blood on our face because they wanted to protect us from the wolves. Um, There's clearly just a big misunderstanding, which is why I found it quite frustrating in the end. How, um, you know, we would go in and the Hackett house fuck shit up, <laughs> kill one of them, blow, you know, the grandma's face off. You know, so like, it, it was frustrating to play this game and then almost turn them into villains through a misunderstanding. I don't think they're evil people, to be honest. So yeah, they just, uh, they rank bottom. I wouldn't really class them as a villain. So yeah, Hackett's 12th place. Okay, so number 11 on our list is Dar from House of Ashes. So, I mean, he was always going to fall into the bottom half of this list, I feel, because he's a supporting character in House of Ashes. But what I do like about uh, Dar in you know, comparison to the Hackett's it's very clear that he is a villain. I mean, sure, you could argue towards the end, you know, you're fighting off the bats together with him. But, you know, because of the American-Iraqi war, he is there to kill the characters that are in play. And there's a number of times where he does try to do that. You think about with Eric and Rachel, with the rope scene. And the fact that he can actually kill off Merwin as well if you manage to keep him long enough to get the radio going. So he does actually take a character out. And I like the fact as well that actually that um, that Supermassive did give him a little bit of depth. I'm pretty sure there's a moment where you're playing as Salim and you can find like a photo of Dar. Like I think it's like Dar and his wife or Dar and his child. So that gives him a little bit of depth. You know, he's not just this complete 2D villain that's out to get everyone. He does have a life away from the war as well. But naturally there are other villains better in this list. So yeah, Dar is number 11. In 10th place, we have from Little Hope, Parva. Now, Parva is the main um, antagonist of the game, but we did actually rank the Little Hope demons later on, which you'll see. Um, Parva, yeah, good villain. He's just, you know, not really memorable. There's just going to be a lot more better villains that are suited to the higher ranks in this list. So Parva kind of naturally falls towards the back. If you ask me, it was a little predictable. He was just kind of like this really kind of like bullish like kind of reverend who would go after accusing people of like being witches which is kind of terrifying in its own right but um the moment the little girl was always kind of like the suspect like mary for potentially being the witch and we kind of knew that wasn't the case it was almost like clearly him and if you found enough of evidence to go against him it's clear you are going to accuse carver to be honest he merely pops up in these flashback scenes so you probably can't the horror almost gets nullified because you know he's in the past, he almost can't affect you now. And obviously the ending of Little Hope, it's a little contrived, it's a little kind of like peculiar anyway. So yeah, I think Carver just struggles to get into the higher ranks. But yeah, still like a decent villain in the Supermassive Games entry nonetheless. Okay, so ninth spot in our list is the Little Hope Demons. And I've got to admit, the first thing I think of when I think of this villain, it, it, it makes me laugh, which I suppose isn't, isn't the best thing. I'll just immediately think back to that Daniel and Taylor scene where they're running away and you've got the demon chasing them walking at 0.2 miles an hour and yet it's a tense scene where you've got to make the QTEs otherwise it's going to catch you and you think, oh, come on, it's not going to get you. 
Um, but you know, I think that you know you've got to bear in mind there are other demons as well. I think the one for Angela is really cool, like the way like it comes out, and it has chains, and it can like almost like lasso her, like Indiana Jones style, and like bring her in and then drown her with like this black gunk from the mouth. That was really good. I think John's one, the way it's awkwardly scuttling along the floor, very reminiscent of perhaps at a stretch, the Wendigo goes from until dawn. And I do like the other one as well, where like dependent on how Tanya dies in the prologue, you get like two different versions. The one where it's obviously been from hanging or one where she's just been burnt to death. So it looks like really charred and stuff. But I think again, like you're talking about these villains, they are imaginary, they're not real. And that does have an impact on like how memorable and like just how villainous they can come across to you. So that's why it perhaps falls lower down in this ranking. Coming in at 8th spot, we have the Pirates from Man of Medan. Now, I really like these villains. I felt they were refreshing. Uh, probably don't get higher because, like, the real threat is kind of, like, the hallucinations. Or not, actually, because the hallucinations are hallucinations and the pirates hallucinating is almost where the horror comes into play. But I really like that dynamic. You've just got these pirates, people who just want a quick bit of, you know, treasure or whatever, but they're seeing things and it makes them that bit more terrifying because they're on the edge. Um, I like the fact as well that there's variation in there. They're not just three people that are copies of each other that are the same. You've got some different characters. You've clearly got this big evil Olsen character. But then, you know, you've got Junior as well. Who you can actually win over and then kind of save and then walk out as a survivor with this guy. So yeah, um, it's pretty nice as well. I, I quite like the fact that, you know, you've get, you get the French accents in there. It's just pretty cool to kind of hear that. So yeah, just um, a solid entry into our list, but unfortunately they fall around the middle of the pack because we are going to get some stronger villains around the corner. Okay, so our number seven spot is HH Holmes. Now this one was a point of contention because as you can see on screen, I put HH Holmes in fourth spot, and whereas he came ninth in Liam's list. So what I'll do is I'll talk about like the positive. So for me, it really is rooted in the performance of the person who voiced H.H. Holmes. On top as well, I think, you know, the fact that we know that this was a real world character does give it some levity, does give it some credence. And I think the way that how like he's just, yeah, that's so chilling, the way he's sort of very accommodating. But of course, we know who he is. We know what his intentions are. And the way things play out so quickly, he's got this apron on and then he can go and attack What's her name? Oh my god, what's her name? It's Marie, isn't it? <laughs> god. Um, yeah, the way you can like, attack Marie in the bathtub and just like be so direct about it. Very frightening. And also, like even when he then comes across in the corridor like, and you've then got... Uh... Why am I forgetting these names? What's the guy's name in Devil in Me prologue? Jeff. Jeff, yeah. Now... Um... And the way like he just stands still and then just watches like he knows he's in complete control he's got the whole corridor system worked out so that he knows that jeff is going to run into that door and then that's going to turn into a gas chamber and then he sadistically watches them both die and then even on top of that you've got the bit before with like the, the floor trap with the spikes underneath so while it is a limited time i feel like that with that time H.H. Holmes did actually make a very good impact. I know this is Jack's one, but I'm going to chime in as to why I put H.H. Holmes so low on my list. You know, he made ninth. So reason being is for the simple fact that it's so limited. He's, he's only in the prologue. I thought his performance was fantastic and chilling, but I just felt the other villains warranted a higher position because he simply is in the game for maybe like, you know, six minutes. And at that, he kills off to Prologue Fodder, which we expect to die anyway. So, um, would have been probably higher if we had more of him and maybe if he was the main villain of The Devil in Me, but unfortunately he wasn't. I'll just add one final point on that as well. I think maybe it's a personal thing that where I actually think that human villains can actually be a lot more worse than like beast villains or like animalistic like villains. And like I say, because of such a short amount of time that he's given, I just think that the whole thing really worked. Which is why Daniel is number one. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> At number six, we have the Man of Medan hallucinations. Now, it's an odd one because they're not actually there. 
or they are there, but people see them as things that are different. So it is like it's quite tough to rank this. However, you think about the sheer variety of what you get in. If it's Fliss seeing Brad as that hooded figure, if it's you know the prologue, uh, Charlie and Joe seeing the little boy run on the ship, how chilling that is. And you know we've all got to mention the Sailor Girl, how it's probably the most iconic shot in Man of Medan, that Sailor Girl. There's just a lot they did with it, and I think if you think about Man of Medan's premise of people hallucinating seeing different things. Um, I just think they did such an effective job of putting variety in there, but really creating that horror ambience. This was the first time we all played DPA and knew what the DPA was, and when we played that for the first time, I felt they did a really good job of putting up all these different things and really making us terrified on the ship. And even if we knew they were hallucinations as well, it was still just really cool to get pitted up against all these different characters. And kind of have to survive against them and I do think there was horror from Man of Medan it might arguably be one of the scarier DPA games and I think these hallucinations are a big um, factor towards that reason. Okay so number five on our list is Dumet. Now as you'll see on the screen I did have him as number seven. Um, I think for me like it's weird because like I mean you could say it's Hector Monday right perhaps we should call him Hector Monday but the backstory is far more interesting of this villain than what we actually see because actually like Dumet and I think this is why he fell a little bit down in my ranking is that I know his whole presence is supposed to be like the strong silent type but for me like I wanted a little bit more from a serial killer and I know you've got the traps and things and that's supposed to tell a lot about his personality but it didn't quite you know translate through to me but nonetheless, when you're doing like the little clips and you've got the stuff about Hector Monday and he's talking to Manny Sherman and you can see like how where his development as a serial killer began, you've got to give it credit in that sense that you're seeing the origins of a serial killer being born. So that's why he sat sort of somewhere in the middle of my list because I couldn't quite figure out whether I liked or disliked the character. Coming in at number four, missing out on a medal. Now, it might be a surprise to some of you, but we have gone and put the werewolves in there. They finished fifth for me, third for Jack. So um, if any of you do love the wolves out there, you can take solace in the fact that Jack did try to give them a medal. But I was the party pooper here that wasn't having any of it. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I like the quarry. I think the wolves are good. They are terrifying. You know, if they go, you know, one on one against the counselor, the wolf is going to win every time. And... You know, they were terrifying being in the rooms with them and such. Um, one thing I really liked about them was the, the blood splatter effect. I thought that was really cool, like the way you see Max in the cell, like burst into one. Nick as well in the pool house. And another cool thing as well is I really do like the dynamic of the bloodline. So like killing one wolf will come kind of completely erase and save every other wolf that they've infected. And I felt that was a really interesting dynamic, which... Um, you know, like we haven't really had in a, you know, sort of like, well, maybe video game, but maybe, you know, just these choice based games. So that was one strong suit for the Wolves. I guess one thing I marked them down on is that there are times where they are clunky. I do think there are some combat scenes where maybe the Wolves aren't brilliant. I'm thinking, I know a lot of people do rate the final Lodge showdown between Caitlyn and the Wolf, but I wasn't a fan of it. Uh, the way like the wolf just looks kind of like a Scooby-Doo villain, the way it's chasing kind of Caitlyn slowly across the balance beam. I just really felt it was like really cartoonish. I wasn't a fan. And the other thing I always, you know, um, beat like a dead horse for a point on this, this channel is that I really wanted Silas to be like a big fuck off white wolf, like in Princess Mononoke or something. You know, we, we heard that Silas was this giant white wolf and I thought it was going to be this really distinct thing. Like maybe twice the size of the other wolves but it's just not like apparently it's the one you fight in the junkyard i didn't know that i could have thought that was caleb or something so yeah there are points where the wolves just you know rank a little bit down for me and i do think you know there are stronger supermassive game villains out there okay so getting the bronze medal of our supermassive game villains ranking is the vampire bats from house of ashes I mean, again, we're getting into the territory now where not only are these villains just very, you know, intimidating and scary, but also they've got a little bit of a backstory to them as well. And that's where I'm going to start with the vampire bat. So especially if you get Rachel towards the end of the game, 
you can find about how like the bats you know they crashed to earth there was a parasite on board and that you know is what ultimately took over the bats i think going as well there's a bit of variation in how the parasite can then take over the humans like you think of joey um and clarice as well and just like you know just the, the look of them is very intimidating you think as well they're very quick they can scuttle along the walls they can fly i think there's that one distinctive shot where like it goes very slow-mo and it's you've got this big creature like the wings out yeah very very it just taps into like the whole vampire lore pretty well or, like you know quite subtly and i think another thing as well is like while it's not ma maybe like a massive horror moment maybe it is more of a personal thing for me but that bit in house of ashes like when you're looking at like the big cocoon and you see the eggs hatching and you see them running down the side there's something very chilling about that for me so uh, yeah they were always going to rank really highly on this list so silver and gold territory funnily enough both villains are from the game until dawn uh, now taking the silver medal just missing out narrowly on the gold we do have the psycho now i know some people probably think that this guy doesn't deserve to be on here but you know same way we had the hackets on here um I do think he deserves to be here because he is essentially a villain, right? There is a point where, boom, yeah, we have the mask reveal and we do realise it's Josh and he's pranking. But he is pretty much a villain for half the game till we work out, you know, who he is and, you know, what he's doing. He does put you in these traps and stuff. He does have that really terrifying mask. I think in terms of, like, a costume and being iconic, the Psycho probably is the best villain on the list. He's the most distinguishable. Um, but yeah, just everything from, you know, the traps he creates, his manner, the voice thing he's got going on. I just think he was really good. Until Dawn does that really effective horror tour where it really throws loads of suspects and you don't know what's going on because at one point we think, you know, there's the Wendigos. At one point we think, yeah, this uh, stranger guy is like the villain going around with the flamethrower. But then we also have the psycho in there as well. And it's when something happens, we don't really know what belongs to what. So he really was this effective, like, tool in there. And I think it was just, like, really done incredibly well how over time we find out that we're the ones doing the Dr. Hill um, psychology scenes as the psycho. And I just felt that, like, adds another dynamic to him as a villain. Um, so, yeah, just a really well executed character that was just superbly written, in my opinion. I'll just add as well, like it shows to like the menace of the character. I mean, obviously we know it's Josh, but the fact that he just full on like assaults his friends, like he full on like whacks Chris round the face. Um, same with Ashley as well. And the fact that he can then stick a syringe in Sam's neck, like the, he was high-fiving her like half an hour ago, which is absolutely insane. And you think of like the voice as well, the intimidating voice. It's got like saw vibes to it. And I'm thinking, like, even with the mask, like, you sort of think of, like, the little puppet in Saw as well. So, like, these, was, these were, like, big, like, tick-boxing things for me in terms of a villain. And therefore, it made it even more surprising when Josh got to be revealed as the psycho. But, of course, maybe unsurprisingly, we're going to give the gold medal to the Wendigo. So, if we're just looking at its appearance for a second, very, like, I don't know, I mean... <sighs> It, it looks very intimidating, doesn't it? With like the big sharp teeth, um, the sort of like the very diluted eyes, like the dead eyes, um, the, the lack of skin and the fact it's all sort of gangly and it's all very quick. It can scuttle up the walls. It can leap at you very quick. Also that it's got strength as well, like a shotgun just won't kill it. Unlike, you know, werewolves. Um, the fact that, you know, you have to basically, you know, with, with fire, um, in order to kill it. You also think it's like the lore as well, like the whole Blackwood Mountain lore of the Wendigo. I liked how that was like layered into the game. And also like even the villains themselves, how they were layered into the game. Like it wasn't necessarily clear who they were, or at least it wasn't to me. Um, and then come the end, you've got like the iconic don't move segment, which really worked well for like the PlayStation, you know, motion controls. And they used that to its full potential there. 
So yeah, I, I just really struggled to think of any negatives for the Wendigo, to be honest. So that's why it took the gold medal for me. I will add in that as well that I, as you can see from the screen, guys, I equally had to give this the gold medal. It had, it was the unanimous winner. Um, and just to back Jack's points up as well, he mentioned the quick time events. I think that is one of the greatest scenes in kind of like final boss history almost, especially in choice based games where you've got the Wendigo screaming at Sam and you've got to like stay still. It's like nearly impossible and it's so rewarding when you get out that lodge and you like manage to save the characters that you mean to. And uh, the other point as well, just how scary they become when they dismantle and you know decapitate the stranger who is basically the person who knows how to fight them uh so when we like lose the psycho as a villain they take over and then it's just this absolutely scary terrifying threat that pips psycho like tenfold so yeah just a really well written like villain and yeah i'm just so happy it's got the gold medal there we go, guys. That is our ranking of the Supermassive Games villains from Until Dawn through to the Devil in Me. Do you agree with this list? What are your lists? Do let us know in the comments below. We'll look forward to reading and replying to them. Anything you want to add, mate, before we wrap up? Nah, not at all. They can screw themselves. <laughs> Good stuff. Right, guys, we will catch you in the next one. See you, guys. Take care.